Using licenses and contracts as effective tools for scholarship. Remarks by Jaron Wilcoxon at the 159th ARL membership meeting. Convened by Ann Walpert. Well, sometimes after lunch you find that people are slumped in their seats, but I can see that's not the case with this crowd. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and ready to uh, do some serious thinking about um, licenses and using licenses as a business tool in negotiation. I'm Ann Walbert and I'm the Director of Libraries at MIT. If I haven't met you, please come and introduce yourself after the meeting. I'd love to know who you are. Um, I'm currently the Chair of the Scholarly Communications Steering Committee of ARL. Uh, and uh, we planned a program for this session that talks to what we need to do in the emerging 21st century. And we think in this committee that one of the things we knew, need to do in the emerging information world of the 21st century is think seriously about the license agreements that we sign with our publishers, database producers, book publishers, as we move into the electronic arena. About 15 years ago, some of you will remember the start of live license when we were deeply worried about what kinds of licenses we would have to sign with publishers of electronic journals. Uh, and we put a lot of effort into creating some model licenses around electronic journal licensing. And then we got distracted by price, and we went off <laughs> we worried a lot about price, and we obsessed about price, and we focused almost all of our negotiating energy on the bottom line of what it was going to cost us. And to a certain extent, while we were doing that, we stopped paying attention quite so closely to the terms and conditions that publishers, database producers, ebook publishers were requiring of us as a condition of handing over $1.4 billion uh, to their coffers. So it seemed to the Scholarly Communications Committee that it was probably a good point in time to pause and say, wait a minute, we're in a business relationship with these people kinds of contracts we negotiate now are going to influence what we can do in the future. We don't want to set the wrong kind of precedence. We don't want to think only about price. We want to think about the terms and conditions under which these materials come into our campuses. In many circumstances, the uh, terms and conditions that they request of us as libraries are totally at odds with the way the academy does its work. They want to define who can use these things. They want to define who's a member of your community. They want to say things about what visitors can do. They want to say things about what affiliated researchers can do. And uh, we need to start paying close attention to these terms and conditions, not just the money, but the terms and conditions. And the way to do that is to begin to think more assertively about the fact that this is a business relationship. We write huge checks to some commercial uh, providers of information, and we need to get back to thinking about what we want as research libraries from that business relationship. And to the extent that we can create common understanding about the fact that this is a business relationship, a common understanding about what we think are best practices that support scholarship and research on our campuses, uh, the better off we all will be. So um, the, the Scholarly Communications Steering Committee was able to hornswoggle <laughs> my friend Jay Wilcoxon who's in the general counsel's office at MIT and who works with the libraries on licensing issues and thinks more broadly about business relationships that are managed through contracts and licenses mm -hmm. to come and have a discussion with us. I promised him we were not going to ask him to lecture for an hour. 
I asked him if he would speak for 15 or 20 minutes, set the stage for us, and then engage in a dialogue with us about what we think the situation looks like, what we might need, how could we think strategically about this business relationship with publishers, <coughs> and just open up our minds a little bit to a new way of thinking about our negotiations as a business relationship in which we have a stake that's greater than dollars. So with that, um, I'm not going to give you a big fancy introduction no, if don't. you don't mind, Jay. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we'll ask Jay to uh, launch us off. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for um, having me here. Um, this is very a new experience for me. I'm usually uh, talking to a room full of lawyers, um, so uh, I'm clearly outnumbered here today, but, uh, but I, I think we can have some fun talking about some, some, uh, some ideas. Um, so let me preface one thing. I'm probably the least knowledgeable person in the room on the topic that we're about to talk about. Um, I work very closely with the MIT libraries. Um, I uh, practice uh, uh, commercial litigation at a big law firm for 10 years. I did a lot of trademark and copyright work. Um, I've now been at MIT for about four years and work very closely with the libraries and other um, parts of the institution on copyright issues. Um, so I have a, you know, a fairly uh, deep knowledge of copyright, but you guys are out um, you know, in the front lines of things dealing with the day-to-day -day, um, issues. So I'm, I'm sure there's a lot that I'm going to say today um, that you could all say better, uh, maybe with more depth. Um, but I at least wanted to kind of think um, through some issues, kind of talk about, set, set the stage for kind of what the issues are, um, talk about some of our own experiences at MIT uh, where we've had successes and, and uh, less successes in trying to negotiate um, interesting um, and different provisions into licenses uh, with the goal of sort of pursuing our own uh, you know, specific institute mission, um, but then also uh, I think a lot of the issues we've dealt with um, apply broadly to all, all research libraries. Um, so, um, Anne's right, I'm not going to talk for an hour. Um, I'm hoping to talk for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, uh, and then hopefully we can have open up the floor to a discussion and hopefully Anne and everybody else will um, facilitate that. I'm happy to ask questions. I probably um, have the same questions and not the answers, but again, I think uh, hopefully uh, by the end maybe we'll at least spark a discussion that we'll, we'll continue on. Um, so just to set the stage, um, and again, I'm probably not going to say anything that you don't all know, but let's you know rewind a few years. Um, uh, as we all know, uh, over the last 10, 15 years, how information is uh, created, delivered, shared, um, has changed in ways that we probably uh, couldn't have imagined 10 years ago. We probably can't imagine the ways that um, that information is going to continue to be shared and, and distributed and, and used um, in the future. Um, and what that has done is created a, a much more complex landscape than what we had um, before. I mean, it used to be very simple. You'd buy a, a journal or a book. It was in hard copy. Um, and uh, we were governed by the law, so we had to worry about first sale doctrine. Pretty straightforward back in the old days, maybe not so much anymore. Uh, fair use, um, never simple to apply fair use, but at least it's a concept that is consistently applied um, uh, based on the, the type of uh, work that you've got. Um, it's a uniform rule, again, hard to apply, but at least we know that's the rule that applies. Um, we got the Section 108 rules, um, and we basically were in a law driven. Uh, construct, and so we knew that uh, those were going to be uniform from, from situation to situation. And, and again, maybe there were challenges in applying those, but we knew we had a fairly uh, finite area to consult when we had to determine what the rules were. Um, but as um, information uh, has uh, been adapted to new technologies, um, we've shifted from a law-driven construct to a contract-driven construct. And as a result, um, each publisher is going to have its own incentives, its own desires, its own goals, um, and the contract between the library and the publisher is going to govern far more than the law. Um, the law is still there, um, but it, we've now got another layer that we need to think about. We've got a patchwork of different rules depending on who you're negotiating with, depending on what the nature of the works are. Um, it's going to get more complicated as books become more electronic. Um, and so you've got uh, just an endless number of rules that need to be uh, thought through. Um, and uh, many times, you know, the rules that are applied by contract can erode the rules that were provided by law. Um, 
you know, you can always agree to things that restrict the, the application of law. And so I think um, uh, where you've got an industry that feels as though uh, its business model is vulnerable, um, whether we agree with that or not, uh, that's their perception, or at least that's what they're saying their perception is. And so their goal is to find ways to maximize revenue, um, impose more and more restrictions on uh, the distribution, the use of, of copyrighted content, um, and to make it harder for uh, to, for libraries to manage uh, how that information can be used. Um, so uh, they also have a lot of resources. They have a lot of smart lawyers. Um, I'm sure you probably uh, have fewer smart lawyers back there to help you. Um, you've got uh, thin resources. You're trying to help your community um, with the underlying goal of your institution, which is to uh, engage in scholarship and research. Um, and so. The negotiation of licenses has become probably something that we don't like to do. Um, it's, it's a distraction from our, our primary purpose uh, in our profession. Um, but it, it creates an opportunity, I think, for publishers to take advantage of that uh, unequal balancing power and, and impose restrictions. So I think the main message here today that I'm hopefully can spark a discussion about is that we need to uh, be more vigilant. Uh, be more thoughtful, uh, perhaps engage campus council or your uh, institution's council on uh, being a thought partner. Um, I don't engage in the day-to-day -day negotiations of licenses, um, uh, but as thorny issues have come up, we've partnered, uh, my office has partnered with the libraries to think about ways to achieve things. You know, lawyers are often perceived as uh, uh, getting in the way of things. Uh, you know, my office, the general counsel's office at, at MIT, has a very strong uh, mandate from the top of my office to help facilitate things, to think creatively, to take risks. Um, and so I think in my interactions with, with the MIT libraries, we've succeeded in, in thinking innovatively about how we can use the licensing process um, as a business tool. Um, and again, obviously price will always be a very driving component of it, but it doesn't need to be the only component. Um, and I think we need to, to recognize that um, we have something that these publishers want, which is cash. Um, they have something that we want, which is resources, and, and uh, thinking strategically about how to um, use our relative bargaining powers to our own advantages is, is, is important. Um, so just as, as I was getting ready to, to, to um, talk to you today, I consulted with um, uh, some of my colleagues in the libraries and looked back at some of the licenses that we've signed um, just to sort of start thinking about some of the key issues that we've encountered, um, where we've succeeded, um, where we, maybe we could do better. Um, and so I was going to kind of share at least a few examples, and then uh, maybe I can open up the floor to a discussion about things that you think we should be looking for, uh, maybe other success stories, uh, other frustrations that we've had um, you know, in, this, in this process. Um, so one of, the, I think, the big successes we, we've had in the last um, couple years is really focused on securing more author rights. Um, we have a faculty uh, adopted open access policy whereby MIT uh, is given a license to all faculty scholarship right from the outset. As soon as it's committed to, to paper, we have a license to it um, for purposes of building our own institutional repository. Um, not surprising, the publishers have pushed back on, on those types of, of policies and are trying to uh, impose restrictions on how we can uh, use those works. Of course, the faculty are off signing agreements that they don't read that also uh, restrict their ability to do that. Um, so we've tried to use you know the licensing negotiations as a sort of a belt and suspenders approach. I mean, let's let's get at this any way we possibly can. And so as part of one of our big uh, licenses, we actually secured uh, rights to the institute to all works in the database uh, that are written by our faculty, our staff, our students. Uh, we're given added rights to those works. So it's not what's governed by the the main uh, license. We've got an addendum that says, if there are works in this database that are written by your faculty, your staff, your student, here's an additional bundle of rights that you get. Um, and those went directly to us. Uh, we, we talked back and forth about should those go to the faculty or they, should they go to the institution. Um, and I was worried, um, you know, the faculty are not parties to the contract. Um, there's no privity of contract. Um, and why don't we get the rights directly to the institution and also secure the right to then grant those rights to the faculty. Um, so we achieved, um, quite surprisingly, a lot of success in that, so that all the work in the database um, uh, that uh, our works by our faculty, we have the right to put those in institutional repository, um, use those for educational uh, course packs, 
uh, to put them on uh, faculty's individual websites uh, to comply with funding agency requirements, um, and that's perpetual. So it's it's, uh, it's it's ours. We can basically port those works into our own institutional repositories. Um, so that's just an example of something where we felt um, we had a very uh, strong mandate from our faculty to um, uh, promote open access, and we recognized that there were a lot of challenges that were being, you know, roadblocks that were being put up uh, by third parties. And so we said, well, let's find other innovative ways that we can help fulfill that, uh, you know, that goal of open access. So, um, you know, I think that's a, a great success story, um, and uh, you know. Uh, we're trying to get it as often as we can. I don't know the, how much more success we've had other than this one instance, but we are trying uh, whenever we can to find ways to uh, facilitate our open access policy so that we can um, uh, help the faculty uh, not get themselves into these binds where they sign incompatible agreements. Um, some other uh, kind of examples of things that we've negotiated that I came uh, just sort of as a really just a kind of a laundry list, and I think one of the things that can be done to, I think, uh, developing a wish list is, a, is an important first step. You know, what is important to our, our users? What is important to um, the research that's going on? Um, you know, what matters to the community? And let's develop a wish list of things that we can think about um, trying to really work into our, our license negotiations. Um, authorized users is a big issue. Um, they try to, faculty, staff, and students are often uh, the universe of users. Um, at MIT, we have so many different permutations of affiliate. Um, I've lost count. Um, I'm sure that, uh, uh, that the numbers are infinite. But you know, these are people who have a legitimate reason to be on our campus, to be doing research, but they don't fit neatly into those boxes. And so uh, making sure that you really have covered um, uh, the entirety of your, your user community is important. Um, and especially in our um, in the complex research institution like us where we've got uh, off-site locations, um, you know, having something that says faculty, staff, and students, and people on premises doesn't really solve the problem because you've got people dialing in from all over the place who may not. Uh, so you know, they call fall between the track, uh, fall between the cracks if you're not thinking about uh, you know who the potential you know, universe of users are. Um, something that um, I think can easily be overlooked is having something affirmative in there um, that, that recognizes and acknowledges fair use. Um, again. It's very easy to contract away what the law provides to you. And uh, these licenses are drafted in so many different ways. They're complicated. They impose a lot of restrictions that may not map neatly to what the law says. And you know there may be inconsistencies. And so making sure that you've got, you know, you're preserving all of the rights that you've got under law um, so that there aren't uh, inadvertent uh, losses of, of you know, what, what is provided to you by, by the law. Um, archive works, making sure that um, company goes out of business, if they uh, uh, for some reason cannot continue to provide the works, that there is a way to keep the works in perpetuity, whether it's providing a, a physical copy on a hard drive that can be loaded onto your system some way to, to ensure that um, uh, as publishers consolidate and are bought and sold and that sort of thing, that there there's enough um, uh, information that can, can be used into the future. Um, you know, MIT is going to be here far longer than, you know, ABC Corporation uh, is going to be here. So we always have to make sure that uh, we protect it, uh, you know, what we need for the future. Um, library loan, I know, interlibrary loan, I know is a big issue. Um, it's, it's not something I have a lot of familiarity with, but I know that um, there are, you know, again, with electronic files, um, publishers are far more concerned about how those can be shared and then redistributed and all of that. And um, trying to think about innovative ways that, um, we can facilitate interlibrary loan requests um, other than printing out a document, scanning it, putting it in the mail, um, you know, uh, is, is I think uh, something that, uh, you know, again, needs, needs to be thought through. Um, in, in addition to authorized users, I think authorized uses is important. You know, personal non-commercial use um, to me is very narrow. Um, what does personal use mean? Does that mean I can read in my living room while watching TV, or you know, what does that mean? So making sure that educational, scholarship, research, uh, academic, you know, broadening the, the, the ways that these can be used uh, is, is important as well. Um, and then an issue that we've found, I mean, we, you know, the, the way uh, grad students and faculty members are using these uh, are, um, the, 
the technologies have become so advanced that um, while I understand that you know crawling and roboting and all of that is is you know I, I recognize the need to have restrictions on that, but they are um, people are so quick and so adept at using these databases and that sort of thing that there is manual behavior that is sort of triggering shutdowns, and so making sure that you've narrowed um, the scope of uh, you know what can cause a shutdown of, of access to the database uh, is something something to think about. I've heard anecdotes of you know, situations where you know there's a live person sitting at the computer and they're just you know very quick, very uh, facile with the, the technology, and then all of a sudden it gets it gets shut down. So um, you know, spidering I can understand, but it needs to be drafted in a way that doesn't sort of incidentally or accidentally bring in other legitimate uses. Um, so um, those are just you know, my sort of opening thoughts on uh, things that we can think about. Um, uh, you know, I think the main message is, you know, we've, we've been negotiating licenses for probably decades now. I don't know if decades, certainly a decade, 15 a decade, years. Yeah. Um, and I think as we migrated over, um, it, they were one-offs, one at a time. Um, and probably now we're 10 years in and we've got this hodgepodge of, of licenses that uh, are inconsistent, hard to follow. And, you know, again, how can we think more broadly, strategically, um, I think you know. Again, a good starting place is something that you would like to see in every one of your licenses. You know, what is important to your institution? Um, what do you need to fulfill the desires and needs of your community? Um, come up with that wish, wish list. Um, think about it. Be strategic about it, and really try at every instance to try to get those um, you know, into your licenses. Um, I think as a group, um, and again, I. Not an antitrust lawyer. I know we have to be mindful of you know conspiring and agreeing to too much, but I certainly think there's a lot of opportunities for groups to develop best practices. You know, model language, sample licenses. Um, I know we rely a lot on the uh, Northeast Research Library um, consortium. Uh, there's a great model license there. Um, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, and the more we're relying on uh, uniform licenses, the more it's going to become. Uh, kind of commonplace for publishers to see uh, these issues raised over and over in negotiations. Um, again, I'll make a plug for your uh, institution's uh, counsel. I think we can be um, thought partners. Again, I don't advocate that lawyers take over the negotiations. I mean, it's it's uh, you're the user community that knows really what you need, um, but we can help think through issues, um, and I'm happy to sort of think through um, uh, how best I think that can be accomplished. I think we've, we've developed a really good system at MIT that works well. Um, don't be afraid to walk away. Um, I think, uh, you know, if you don't pony up enough money, they'll, they'll be happy to walk away. Um, but I think um, uh, they, they need us as much as we need them. And I think, uh, you know, being willing to be firm and, and stick to certain principles um, is, uh, you know, something that it's, it's, it's hard. Um, but I think. Uh, it's something that, that shouldn't be um, uh, discarded. So. Great. So. Okay. Um, thanks. Thank you for listening. Music was provided by Josh Woodward. For more talks from this meeting, please visit www.arl.org.